Just after 3 p.m. on Friday, September 2, 2016, Lauren Landavazo and her friend Michaela Smith, both 13, were taking their usual route home from school. As they were passing through an alleyway in their hometown of Wichita Falls, Texas, a vehicle they had never seen before suddenly came to a stop in front of them. When a young man got out and eyed them up and down, the girls, thinking he was pulling some sort of prank, had ignored him and kept walking. Within seconds, one of the middle schoolers would be lying mortally wounded on the pavement, and the other would be fighting for her life. Investigators would later learn that after staring Lauren and Michaela down, the driver had retrieved a rifle from his SUV and started shooting. In total, 16 shots were fired, 15 of which had struck Lauren. Michaela, who had been hit in the chest by the first round, had somehow found the strength to run to safety. After emptying his weapon, the shooter had fled the scene as dozens of witnesses, most of whom were also students on their way home from McNeil Middle School, looked on in horror. As ambulances rushed to the scene, word of the shooting spread quickly. When an acquaintance of Bianca Landavazo phoned to tell her that students had been shot nearby, she made a beeline to the site. Upon her arrival, she observed paramedics working furiously over the broken form of her only daughter. Eyewitnesses who were interviewed after the fact stated that they would be forever haunted by the sound of the distraught woman's screams. Lauren's father Vern, who had left work as soon as he learned of the shooting, arrived a short time later. Unable to process what he was seeing, he convinced himself that his child would be all right. Bianca, who had seen the extent of the damage, knew different. At the hospital, the Landavazos were informed that their daughter, who had just started the eighth grade, had succumbed to her injuries. The medical examiner would determine that she had sustained 15 bullet wounds from a 22 caliber rifle. Two of the shots had been to the head, either of which would have proved fatal. Her cause of death was ruled homicide. Michaela was admitted to the hospital in serious condition. When interviewed by detectives, she had described the perpetrator as a young white male with chestnut-colored hair that hung loosely around his face. Though she had seen him only briefly, she recalled that he had a prominent nose and scattering of acne across his cheeks. In no time at all, witnesses came forward to say that the suspect had been driving a gold SUV that had sped away from the scene before the smoke cleared. Their recollections, coupled with Michaela's remarkably accurate description of the shooter, helped police create a composite sketch which was quickly released to the public via local news outlets. Less than 48 hours after the incident, authorities received a tip from a concerned citizen claiming that she had seen her neighbor, 20-year-old Cody Lott, carrying what looked like a rifle case into his apartment on the day of the murder. Since he lived only a stone's throw from the alley where the incident had taken place, detectives decided that Mr. Lott needed some looking into. Coincidentally, just as this information was coming to light, a couple notified authorities that they had seen a young man in a gold SUV parked near a makeshift memorial that had been erected at the site of the shooting. Since the sighting had occurred only moments earlier, officers sped to the scene in the hopes of nabbing their suspect. As they neared the area in question, patrolmen spotted a gold SUV heading in the opposite direction. After signaling the driver to pull over, officers requested permission to search the vehicle. Since he had recently cleaned the interior from top to bottom, the overly confident young man behind the wheel, who identified himself as Cody Lott, gave them the go-ahead. While nothing pertinent to the investigation was found, a pair of brass knuckles were uncovered. Since they were illegal in Texas at the time, Lott was taken to the station and booked for possession of a dangerous weapon, which carried a hefty fine and possible jail time. Once they had him in custody, authorities ushered Lott into an interrogation room where they questioned him as to his knowledge of the double shooting. At first, he lied through his teeth, claiming total ignorance on the subject. After an hour or so, however, he had become so comfortable in the company of detectives, that he began to weave a disturbing story that made everyone in the room sit up and take notice. Animated and bursting with nervous energy, Lott spoke of having become infatuated with Lauren after seeing her pass by the apartment he shared with his mother and stepfather. Taken by her physical appearance, specifically her icy blue, green eyes, he would wait by the window every day when school let out to gaze at her from afar. Over time, he grew to believe that the pretty brunette belonged to him in every sense of the word. Lot's unrequited love turned to hate one afternoon when he saw the object of his obsession walking hand in hand with a boy her own age. Infuriated at what he viewed as the ultimate act of betrayal, 
He decided then and there to make the 13-year-old, whom he had never even spoken to, sorry she ever crossed his path. Though he had been in relationships in the past, none had lasted very long. He would later confess to a court-appointed psychiatrist that he harbored hate in his heart for those of the female persuasion. Emotionally immature and unrealistically demanding, Lot had driven his girlfriends away, one by one. Lonely and envious of those around him who were in healthy relationships, he had retreated into an imaginary world where Lauren, who seemed perfect in every way, was devoted to him, and only him. Seeing her with someone else had ruined everything, and for that, she had to pay. Hell-bent on revenge, he had taken one of his stepfather's rifles from the gun cabinet on the day of the shooting in preparation for what was to come. When Lauren and Michaela came into view, he had grabbed the weapon and jumped into his SUV. After pulling up in front of them, effectively blocking their path, he had opened fire. The first bullet had hit Michaela, knocking her to the ground. The other rounds were saved for Lauren, who had been the target all along. He lamented the fact that he had run out of ammunition, which was the only reason Michaela, who had seen his face and therefore could identify him, had lived. In the next breath, tossing the jealous rage excuse out the window, Lot had patted himself on the back as a hero who had acted selflessly to save Lauren from the dangers she would have faced later in life. The way he saw it, by killing her at a young age, he had preemptively rescued her from the clutches of rapists and other predators. Simply put, by taking her life, he had spared her from the evils that lay ahead. After being guided back to reality by his interrogators, Lot went on to say that he had fled from the scene when he noticed that a crowd was starting to gather. In a panic, he had ditched the murder weapon in a field. Later that evening, when he was sure the coast was clear, he had retrieved the gun and put it back where he found it. Since he had no known ties to the victims, he assumed that he was free and clear. He had placed little importance on the fact that he had opened fire on the helpless schoolgirls in broad daylight in the presence of dozens of onlookers. Struggling to understand his motives, detectives asked him to elaborate on why he killed someone who didn't even know he existed. Still hyped up and excited by the attention he was receiving, he explained that he wanted a girlfriend and thought she was going to be the one. When he discovered that she already had a boyfriend, he decided that if he couldn't have her, no one would. Seemingly enthralled by the sound of his own voice, Lot added that he had an accomplice who had encouraged him every step of the way. According to him, the like-minded fiend who had been pulling the strings on the days leading up to the shooting was none other than the devil himself. Lot went on to say that he had consulted with Mr. Scratch before moving forward with his murderous plan. When the king of the netherworld agreed that Lauren was only getting what she deserved, any doubts he may have had about following through with the shooting disappeared. Thanks to his ever-supportive ally, carrying out the murder, which he referred to as an assassination, had been a breeze. Having heard enough, authorities charged Lot with one count of first-degree murder and one count of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Despite his confession, he had pleaded not guilty on both counts. Nonetheless, he was held over on $4 million bail pending trial. A search of Lot's electronic devices revealed that his cell phone held a number of images of underage girls performing sexually explicit acts. As a result, possession of child pornography was added to his list of punishable offenses. When investigators spoke to one of Lot's former girlfriends, she remembered him as a terror who had once tried to strangle her with a seatbelt in a fit of temper. After she ended the relationship, she claimed that Lot had kidnapped and tortured her and her young son. Knowing full well what he was capable of, she hadn't reported the incident to police for fear of retaliation. It was only when she learned he had been arrested that she felt safe in coming forward. His narcissism kicking into overdrive, Lot had kept close tabs on news coverage of the case. When he learned that the media were characterizing the shooting as a random act of violence, he was fit to be tied. The shooting had taken weeks of thoughts and planning, and he wanted everyone to know it. In a mind-boggling lack of self-awareness, he continued to maintain his innocence, even as he demanded recognition for the tireless efforts that had gone into killing Lauren. Acquaintances described Lot as a spoiled sort who had been coddled since the day he was born. Believing that the world, and everyone in it, should bend to his will, he was characterized as a short-tempered tyrant who had taken much and given little in return. A recreational drug user and social misfit, Lot was widely regarded as an oddball. Though he managed to function normally when it suited his purposes, 
he had straddled the line between acceptable behavior and off-the-rails lunacy for as long as anyone could remember. Lott's trial was originally scheduled for March of 2018, but was postponed when the defense successfully argued that he was of unsound mind and therefore incapable of understanding the proceedings. Six months later, after undergoing intensive treatment at a psychiatric facility, he was deemed competent to stand trial. Laying out their case before the jury, District Attorney Maureen Shelton and Chief Prosecutor Ron Poole contended that Lott was a calculating killer who had stalked his teenage victim for nearly a year prior to taking her life. They stressed that Michaela would have died on the pavement that day as well, had the defendant not run out of ammunition. On the other side of the equation, Lott's defense team held that their client suffered from various mental illnesses that had rendered him unable to distinguish right from wrong. They argued that even if he was the shooter, he had acted on impulses beyond his control. He wasn't a calculating killer, but rather a victim of the intrusive thoughts that threatened to consume him. After hearing both perspectives, on September 19, 2018, the jury deliberated for 40 minutes before finding Cody Lott guilty as charged. At the conclusion of the penalty phase, he was sentenced to life in prison plus 20 years. In keeping with current policies in the state of Texas, he will be eligible for parole in 2048. Barring anything unforeseen, he will be 52 years old when he makes his first bid for freedom. Before, during and after the trial, Lot was the picture of arrogance. Never once did he express an ounce of regret for murdering an eighth grader in cold blood and permanently scarring her friend, both physically and emotionally. Michaela, who had come face to face with a killer and miraculously survived, carries a reminder of that dreadful day with her everywhere she goes. Since removing the bullet would have likely done more harm than good, the projectile remains lodged in her chest. While doctors hope that it will shift over time to an area where it can be safely extracted, there are no guarantees that such a day will ever come. As a way of paying tribute to Lauren and honoring Michaela's ongoing struggles, a statue of a regal black horse was erected on the grounds of McNeil Middle School. In addition to displaying positive messages such as, love, and, live, the monument featured purple and blue paw prints, the girls' favorite colors. For those who loved Lauren, and lost her in the most inconceivable of ways, the statue was the perfect memorial to the girl who had always shown compassion to animals and humans alike. Kind to everyone she met, she had a reputation at school for being the self-appointed welcome wagon. In an effort to make them feel at home, she would go out of her way to be friend with new students. It wasn't lost on those close to her that she would have treated Lot with a level of respect he didn't deserve, had she been given the chance. While she would have had no interest in pursuing a relationship with an adult male, she would have readily offered her friendship. Sadly, it's apparent from his delusional ramblings that nothing she could have said or done would have changed what her killer had in store. Proving that the lowest common denominators in life seldom rest, on October 1, 2020, vandals made off with the statue after forcibly removing it from its foundation. Following an extensive search, the forever horse was found smashed to pieces in a barn in neighboring Clay County. Thanks to a tip line set up by police, two locals, 19-year-old Zachary Kaiser and his buddy Tyler Darland, were arrested two months later and charged with theft and destruction of property. Their accomplices, Dakota James and Braden Seward, were taken into custody a short time later. Kaiser was ultimately found guilty and ordered to pay $400 in restitution. As punishment for his crimes, he would also spend the next two years behind bars. In a surprising move, the judge suspended his sentence at the request of Lauren's parents, who felt that he stood a better chance of finding redemption outside of prison walls. It was a charitable gesture to be sure, but their optimism was lost on Kaiser who was in trouble with the law again a mere four months after his release. Having proven that he couldn't be trusted to abide by the rules of society, the court decided that he should serve out the remainder of his sentence in jail. With the help of their friends and neighbors, the victim's families were able to commission a replacement statue. On May 27, 2021, a second memorial was put in place in front of the school. Hopefully, this one will truly be, forever. On June 11, 2019, Texas passed Lauren's Law, which makes the deliberate slaying of a child under the age of 15 a capital offense. At the time of Lauren's murder, the age was 10, making her killer ineligible for the death penalty. Her parents, who worked tirelessly to get the law on the books, 
hope that the stricter guidelines will deter individuals like Lot from preying upon the most vulnerable among us. Although the law isn't retroactive, and therefore has no bearing on their daughter's case, the land of Azos take comfort in knowing that their efforts may help the families of future victims find the closure they deserve.